For a young man, all is decorous when he is cut down in battle and torn with the sharp bronze, and lies there dead, and though dead, still all that shows about him is beautiful. But when an old man is dead and down, and the dogs mutilate the gray head and the gray beard and the parts that are secret, this, for all sad mortality, is the sight most pitiful. Hello and welcome to the Spouter Inn. Thank you for joining us. My name is Chris and I'm joined, as always, by Suzanne Akbari. Hi, Chris. It's exciting to be here. It is super exciting. Uh, This is our first episode. We're recording it early in the new year. Happy New Year. Happy New Podcast. And uh, I guess we should explain to everyone why we've brought you into this cozy room. So Suzanne here is a professor of literature and someone who I've had the pleasure of working with in my past life as an academic. And Suzanne, you specialize in medieval literature. But you've also studied and taught texts throughout the world, throughout literary history, throughout uh, everything. Yeah. I'm, I'm Like I think maybe a lot of our readers, I've always been a big reader and a curious reader from, from childhood. And at a certain point, and I think this was probably in graduate school, I started to get a sense of how some major books fit into a bigger picture of, of what you could call literary history. They're books that seem to be speaking to one another at times, to be in a kind of a conversation. And a lot of other books seem to be responding to them. And so I, got a, I started to get a sense of this and to want to talk about it and to teach it in the classroom. Sometimes this plays out in the context of what people call world literature. Other times it's in the context of what sometimes gets called great books. And there's a lot to say about that. Uh, What do we mean by great books? Um, Why might these books be worth reading? And I kind of like to see the pattern that emerges when we look at the shape of the individual book, but also when we think about the books altogether uh, as a kind of a forest made up of many individual trees. And uh, yeah, a forest that... uh might possess a few dangers and the possibility of getting quite lost, but uh, you will help guide us through it. Uh, Like a lot of people, I've read some of these great books, but uh, I don't really read them as much anymore, even though I have a lot of fond memories of at least some of them. Uh, I have some other memories about some of them too, but I'm looking forward to being reacquainted with some of them and, and, and coming across some new ones as we, as we wander through this forest while in this inn. Our metaphors are terrible, but that's okay. Um, (laughs) Well, the more metaphors, the better. I mean, that's the, you know, one of the reasons I was so excited about doing this together is because I think that with, you know, great books, with major pieces of literature, people encounter them in the classroom. They encounter them as work, as the thing you have to do, where there's some kind of obligation or burden associated with it. But it seems to me that these books are I don't know. They're kind of wonderful. They are strange, bizarre little pathways into the past that sometimes have compelling things to tell us about ourselves, to tell us about now or where we might go. And I feel like this is an opportunity not to talk about these books in a prescriptive way or like, you know, as if you're compelled to learn about them, but just why they might be good to look at and where you might go with them. Yeah. And, and how you might look at them and how you might approach them. Uh, whether it's sitting down and reading them cover to cover or just listening to a podcast about them or reading sections of them or watching a movie based on just some way of interacting with all these different stories. There's lots of different possibilities. And I think, I think we're both completely open to, to any of them. Yeah. I think in particular too, thinking about these books, not as isolated, you know, as standing entirely on their own, but being in conversation with one another um, in something like the way I mentioned and the way we're going to try to approach them together. Uh, When you first suggested to me that we might think about doing this podcast together, one of the things we came up with was the idea of doing clusters of books where we might put, let's say, three of them together in a sequence of uh, uh, three, three podcasts so that there's not just one book that we're talking about, but we're talking about the conversations that they're having with one another. And I'm kind of hoping that as time goes by, the conversation becomes, to use another metaphor, a web, you know, interconnected in a way that's interesting to listeners. So they can listen to just one, but they can also listen to a couple of them and start making more connections for themselves, whether they're just listening or whether they're reading along. So you've started out by choosing three books, three texts that are perhaps connected by how foundational they are to quite a lot of the Western literary tradition and perhaps the global one as well, to a a different degree. So uh, can you give us a little 
information about what books we're going to be starting out with. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I was listening to you just saying that these are foundational books, maybe in connection with the Western tradition, maybe in connection with the world literature connection. And I think that's going to be a really interesting point for us to talk about. Whose books are these? Are they books that belong to a particular tradition, a particular subset of people? Um, are they universal in some way? Like, on what ground do we approach these? And I don't want to Again, I don't want to be prescriptive and say, this is the one way we can look at these books. I'd like us to kind of start opening them up, flipping through the pages, and maybe get somewhere together and thinking about you know, whose books are these. And so for the first three books, we're going to start out with Homer's Iliad, which is a story about the war in Troy. Uh, thousands of years ago. Then we're going to go on to Plato's Symposium, which is one of my very favorites. It's a dialogue, um, and it's about love, but maybe not in the way you might expect. And then the third one is Ovid's Metamorphoses. Maybe not a whole lot of our listeners have read The Metamorphoses. I'd be surprised if very many people have read it cover to cover. It's super long. But I think almost everybody knows something about it because The Metamorphosis is when one thing, a person, changes into another thing, a stone, a tree, uh, a flower. Um, and so things like Narcissus or other kinds of really famous legends are things that people will have encountered maybe in art, sculpture, um, or in other kinds of poetry. I said before, there's this whole question of great books. Are these books you're supposed to read, books that are important to read, books that you ought to have read? The books that I've chosen for us to talk about, and when I teach class, it's the same thing. I Yeah, I teach I choose books that are important, but above all, I choose books that I feel really strongly about, that I have a lot of emotions about. And it might be that I love them. It might be that I'm made angry by them. It might be that I'm puzzled by them. But the logic behind that is that if I don't feel something about that book, I'm not going to teach it in an interesting way. I'm not going to talk about it in an interesting way. And if I'm bored, the person who's listening to me is going to be bored. So the things that I've suggested we talk about are, are always going to be things I have feelings about. Fantastic. Well, let's begin with the Iliad. I thought that we would start our first set of books by starting to talk about Homer's Iliad. Now, Chris, I know that you've read the Iliad before because we taught it together some years ago. What do you remember about it? What sticks out in your memory? So we did teach it together, but we didn't have the students read the book from cover to cover. And I, in fact, have not read the book cover to cover. It's long. Mm. It's very long. Mm. What I remember about it, it's an ancient Greek epic poem. It was put down in, its, in the form that we have it today about 2,800 years ago, give or take, which puts it a few hundred years before a lot of the other famous things from ancient Greece, such as Plato or Sophocles or all these other, uh, the, the, the biggest moment of the flourishing of ancient Greek culture. It also puts it a few hundred years after when we believe the historical events of the Trojan War would have happened. So it's at this interesting point. Uh, it is does not, as many people think before they've encountered it, tell the entire story of the 10-year-long Trojan War, from how it started to the Trojan horse bit at the end. It doesn't include either of those. As I recall, it takes place around year nine, and it takes place over a few days. And it's just a slice of, of a moment. It's just a moment, an opportunity to tell a story within this grander story. It tells a story about Achilles, the hero from the Greek side, uh, who starts off very upset with his with his fellow Greeks. <laughs> well, upset, wrath. Wrath. <laughs> as as we're told at the very beginning, this is a poem about the wrath of Achilles and what happens because of that wrath. He's very upset with his fellow Greeks because uh, he believes he there's a prize that should be rightfully his, and the other Greeks are not so sure. The prize in question is uh, a woman, uh, Briseis, I believe her name is. And that moment of being upset with the other Greeks and not really wanting to play with them anymore has a lot of follow-on effects that are explored over the course of the poem, leading to uh, an epic battle with the Trojans' main hero, Hector, who, spoiler alert, dies, and which eventually leads to a kind of reconciliation, or at least a very touching moment at the end between the leader of the Trojans, Priam, father of Hector, and Achilles. I don't remember anything getting resolved with Briseis, though. No, <laughs> she no. She just kind of fades away. No. Well, yeah, she does and she doesn't. Like One of the moments that I'm hoping we'll talk about um, is, is a really odd moment with Briseis where, how can I put it, uh, it's not so much that she fades away, but we know what's going to happen. And something you said a little earlier uh, strikes me as so super important. You were saying how the poem as we have it is like thousands of years old, but it dates from a few hundred years after the events that it's narrating, which means that for people 
the very first readers and hearers of this poem, they knew the story. They knew the whole story. They'd heard legends. They might have heard other literary versions of it as well. They knew the end. They knew the beginning. Um, for them, as you said, this is a slice of the story, right? It's, it's, it's a short period, uh, if not a moment. It's, it's, a, it's a period of weeks. Um, but in those weeks, the whole story is kind of distilled and condensed. And it's really, and I think one of the reasons it's so incredibly powerful is because of that. It's a really long work, but it's very, very boiled down. It's incredibly powerful. And uh, when you were talking about the character of Achilles and the extent to which he kind of anchors our entry into the narrative, I think that's also a really important point. When I teach this work, I very purposely don't teach it beginning to end. I don't say, oh, okay, you know, it's 24 books long, right? It sounds really long, but the books are short. Um, I don't say, okay, read the first four books and then read the next four. Instead, I say, here's the big picture. Here's the Greeks. Here's the Trojans. The, these are the main players on the Greek side. These are the main players on the Trojan side. This is what Achilles is like. This is what Hector is like. And then I'll, I'll say, you know, read these various books, like read book one, read book six, read book nine, as a way of kind of organizing the story out of order. And the reason I do that is, is this. It's a way of kind of capturing, to some extent, to the extent we can, that kind of experience that the earlier listeners of the poem might have had, um, where, you, where I've already told you how it's going to go. We know the plot. It's not like a novel where, or a detective story where you have to read page by page. You have to be careful not to peek ahead because you're going to ruin the story for yourself. You cannot ruin the Iliad. And that's going to be true of a lot of the other things that we talk about. You don't need to read them page by page. In fact, it's kind of better to read them out of order sometimes. Um, but by dividing the book up in that way and sort of saying, look, this is the shape of it. This is the shape of the the conflict that's going on. This is the entryway in through Achilles' wrath. Wrath is the very first word of the poem, right? So you might think about, well, what do we mean by that? Why is wrath the thing that anchors this entire poem? Um, it tells us something about people. It tells us something about men. It tells us something about collateral damage. You were asking about Briseis. That's collateral damage for you. Absolutely. There are a, a lot of other things that I remember about the Iliad, but I don't want to get too bogged down. But I do feel like I should mention Patrocles, mm. who is a very good friend of Achilles. And quite a lot has been read into their relationship over the years, especially uh, paired with what I recall as a bit of a, a bit of a reluctance on Achilles' part to, so to speak, enjoy his prize, Briseis, to, to, you know, to rape her, basically. He doesn't do that, as I recall. Well, we don't know. I mean, we don't know exactly what's going on there in the tent of Achilles. You know, um, it, it, maybe this might be a good moment to, to go to a passage from the poem. Sure. Because when you're asking me to sort of think about what are the what are the passages we might like to especially talk about, what are the moments we might like to highlight, at first I thought, oh, I'll go pull out my notes from when I teach this class and figure out what are the most important passages. And I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. Let me just take the book and, and, and literally just fan the pages and, and open up to a page. And I wasn't using the copy of the Iliad that I usually use for my classroom text where it's all dog-eared. It was a copy that I had at home that I haven't marked up. And so, so you know, it didn't fall open to a page I look at all the time. So when I opened it up, I came to a passage that was about Briseis, um, who you just mentioned, who's this person who is war booty, who's being fought over, who's the reason that Achilles is so incredibly bent out of shape in the opening of the Iliad. Uh, she's been captured, and Agamemnon, who's the leader of the Greek armies, uh, wants to have her for his own. Achilles thinks that he should have her, and then there's this whole conflict that they have over this. And so Briseis ends up in Achilles' tent, Ach uh, along with Patrocles, who is his best friend, his companion, um, and they're clearly bound together in this bond of love. Um, and there's this weird moment. Um, um, can I read it? Absolutely. Yeah. Please do. So I'm just going to flip open the book to read this passage. It's in book 19. So Patrocles has just been killed in battle. Um, for reasons that we could talk about. Um, Achilles doesn't want to fight. He's so incredibly aggravated with the rest of the Greek army who refuses to go out there on the field. And a lot of the Iliad is preoccupied with people just trying to persuade Achilles, please go out and fight so we can beat these Trojans once and for all. And Patrocles figures, you know, uh, I know how I'm going to get Achilles out there. I'm going to borrow his armor so everybody thinks it's Achilles and go out on the field. And so he goes out predictably uh, and he's killed, right? So um, his body's there. Okay, so let me read a little bit. And now, in the likeness of golden Aphrodite, Briseis, when she saw Patroclus lying torn with sharp bronze, folding him in her arms, cried shrilly above him, and with her hands toward her breasts, and her soft throat, and her beautiful forehead. The woman, like the immortals mourning for him, spoke to him. Patroclus, 
I left you here alive when I went away from the shelter, but now I come back to find you have fallen. You would not let me, when swift Achilles had cut down my husband and sacked the city of godlike Menes, you would not let me sorrow, but said you would make me godlike Achilles' wedded lawful wife, that you would take me back in the ships to Phythia and formalize my marriage among the Myrmidians. Therefore I weep your death without ceasing. You were kind always. That's that's a really interesting sentiment for somebody who has been taken away as a prize to express to her that's yeah and well, also, her, her what like her, what her is what? he to her her, right? her fixer her, her this person who's who's in the middle of the negotiations for her to get what she's hoping to get out of having been kidnapped yeah well Patroclus is a really interesting person he's an odd character right so he's as i said best friend uh closest uh, friend lover intimate with achilles achilles cares more about Patroclus than anybody else deeply attached to him and he's clearly I want to say a kind person, because that is the word that Perseus uses of him. We see him a little earlier on ministering to um, uh, fallen uh, Greek soldiers on the field. He's someone who, like you said, a fixer, but not a fixer in a cynical sense, someone who's really trying to make things better around him. And maybe that's part of the reason why Achilles loves him so much. And so Perseus, it's such a weird moment when she's mourning for him. Mourning, the, the poet says, like the immortals. You know, it's people in this poem are beautiful at strange moments. They're beautiful when they're joyful, but they're also beautiful when they're most sad, um, beautiful when they're healthy and strong, and also beautiful when they're torn down at certain moments. So it's a very odd poem. And that moment is one of the oddest ones of all. She's mourning for Patroclus, not, I think, purely in the self-interested way, oh, Patroclus, you were going to straighten things out for me. You were going to make sure that Achilles actually married me when this was all over and that I got back home. Um, you were kind always. Um, so they've clearly been living in Achilles' tent in this strange kind of uh, almost family group. There's this one moment where some of the other soldiers come in to talk to Achilles, trying to persuade him to get out in the field. And Patroclus lays out food on the table, um, bread and other things. It's, it's a very domestic moment. Um, so they've got this strange kind of household. So the Iliad is full of these weird kinds of moments. I think it does uh, manage to do a lot of work at once. I think, as you say, it expresses the general sense of who Patroclus is, uh, that he's kind, while also highlighting her own precarity that is suddenly much more precarious now that the person that she was specifically relying on uh, is gone without having achieved what she needed of him. Not necessarily in a strictly quid pro quo, I need you functionalist, not as, you know, well, he was her hope. You yeah, know, we, we, yeah. we think about, I don't know, you know, we read sometimes in the media about somebody who's imprisoned, who's been kept in a basement for a certain period of time or whatever. Like, she, she's she been kind of – she's a prisoner, right? I mean, she may not be in, in, a, in a jail, but she's captured. She's away from home. She's probably never going to get back. Um, who knows what will happen to her? Will Achilles give her away? Will he be killed? Will he get tired of her? And just, you know, what, what will happen? And – Patroclus, because he was kind, was her hope that something might be different. Uh, and I find that really moving. I think when people think about the Iliad, they're like, oh, it's about war and men killing each other. And yeah, it is about that. I mean, and there's a ton of that. And it's, some of the scenes are incredible and, and thrilling. And I hope we'll talk about a couple of them. But it's also about women a lot. Um, and I think people are often surprised by that. Yeah, I remember some uh, some very moving scenes with with Priam's family yeah, as well, yeah. and, and the, specifically the women uh, who are anxious about what will happen to their their husbands and fathers and sons mm. as they go out into this battle, the, the, with the sense that they'll be able to watch it happen because they are on the ramparts being able to see the battle that's taking place outside the city walls, mm. making it even more immediate than a lot of women left behind by male soldiers would have experienced. Yeah, it's very theatrical almost. You know, there's a number of scenes in the Iliad where that's exactly what's going on, where people are up on the ramparts watching the battle, uh, um, people in Troy, because the Greeks are outside the walls of the city, right? And so on the Trojan side, like I said, there's this weird theatrical kind of quality. And when I say theatrical, I don't mean that it's artificial or not real, because it's all too real. Like you said, uh, people who are on the ramparts are looking at what, what's going to happen to their loved ones. They're sometimes seeing their loved ones cut down, right? So theatrical in the sense that it's a spectacle they're watching. Um, and, you know, thinking about what's going to happen to their loved ones, but also them. Every time another Trojan hero is cut down, 
it's that much closer to the end of the city. And what happens at the end of the city, right? The city will be burned. The women will be raped. The children, a lot of them will be killed. And they know this. And the listeners know this, right? It's a, it's a, so it's kind of an awful poem. Like I said, I have a lot of feelings about this poem. I think it's beautiful, but I think it's just awful too, um, in a way that's really powerful. Well, and in a way that you'd expect a, a long meditation on the impact of wrath to be. It's not It's not a happy emotion. No, <laughs> um, no. And it's not strictly the wrath of Achilles of, uh, that's being dealt with. It's really a, a lot of different forms of this being pushed around, I imagine. Yeah. Well, the wrath of Achilles is what we start with. You know, the first word of the poem is menin, you know, it, it, wrath, and it's the wrath of Achilles that our attention is drawn to in particular. But there's multiple levels in the narrative. You might remember us talking about this when we taught this this work years ago. Um, we're, all, we're hearing about human beings and what's going on with the Greeks and the Trojans, but we're also hearing about the gods. And the gods are on the one hand, they're divine, right? So they're on a different level. But the kinds of stuff that's happening amongst the gods parallels in all kinds of interesting ways what's happening in the world of men, right? They're pissed off with one another. They're on. They're taking sides against one another. So um, I don't think, and I'm trying to remember now, I don't think wrath, the word gets used to talk about the feelings of the gods toward one another, but they are full of emotions and, and you know, uh, competing against one another in a way that very much parallels what's happening in the world of men. And then there's these weird crossover moments between the gods and, and mankind. And one of the ways that happens is sometimes you'll have a figure, Achilles is one of them, who's got a parent who's one of the gods, right? So Achilles' mother is divine, and, and that turns out to be a little bit important uh, a little bit later on in the narrative. Um, but also there are moments where there's this kind of link between the world of the gods and the world of mankind when they're addressing one another. So that might be like a moment of prayer. It might be when the human beings are making sacrifices. They're having a feast. And the first thing you do, um, anybody who's read the Percy Jackson kids' books will know this too. The first thing you do at a feast is you put some of the food in the fire as an offering to the gods. And so in the Iliad, there are these moments where it's very formulaic, where um, the scent and the smoke is said to rise up and the gods... Um, eat, as it were. They consume what it is that people are, are feeding them. And this idea of this, this kind of connection between those two worlds, it's like there's a veil between these two worlds, but it's porous at moments. And there's a couple of moments where the gods actually come down on the field and either fight as themselves or fight in disguise. And those are very uncanny moments. So they're two worlds, but they bump up against one another sometimes. Um, so I don't know, somebody who's found vampires or things like that, or like the Twilight books or something interesting, y y there, there are certain kinds of analogies there where you've got two worlds that are ordinarily invisible to one another, but they bump up against one another at times. As I recall, I mean, this is tickling my memory and you'd have to, you've, you've thought about this more recently than I have, but as I recall, quite a lot of the events are explained for both human and divine reasons. Mm -hmm. So going down to very specific events on the battlefield, for example, but also larger scale events, like why is this war happening and why is it still, why is it not allowed to end? Yeah, It's because humans are making certain choices out of anger, out of wrath, out of whatever. And also the gods are making choices and they won't allow it to end yet because they want to see their satisfaction against each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I think the Iliad, you're right, I think is preoccupied with this question. Do we choose what to do? Do we choose what happens to us? Do we make outcomes take place? Or is it predetermined in some way? Is it being controlled from outside of us? The Iliad is concerned with this. And actually, as I think about it now, quite a number of the you know so-called great books we'll be talking about are really interested in this problem. Um, we might at some point later on look at Milton's Paradise Lost. Again, something people, probably not a lot of listeners are reading for pleasure, right? Um, but it's awesome. They might have encountered it in class. But there's all kinds of weird stuff going in there. And Milton's Paradise Lost is fundamentally concerned with, do you choose or does stuff happen? Um, and, and, you know, which one of us knows the answer to that? Do you choose what happens to you? How much is it up to you what happens? I think we've all asked that question. But in addition to that, I think there's a kind of, I think this doubling of explanation, this doubling of motivation mm. just adds a kind of interpretive richness to this, where it's not just a matter of do you choose or do the gods choose? Mm -hmm. It's a matter of you have both of these explanations available for you at all times. Yeah. And they play up against each other in interesting ways. And it, in a sense, it, it, I imagine that if you're looking at the world this way, then it just feels richer. 
Yeah. No, I think that's a lot of it. I think sometimes it's very ambiguous as to what extent things are being determined by people's choices and to what extent things are being determined by the gods' choices. But occasionally you get a moment in the Iliad where it's like so clear that no matter how hard you try or how good you are or how well set up you are to be successful, the gods will just sometimes really screw you over. And the moment I'm thinking of, and you're going to remember it, is this great moment near the end of the uh, of the Iliad, I think it's book 22, where Hector, who's the, 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 the most outstanding fighter on the Trojan side. I mean, there are other outstanding fighters, but he's the most outstanding fighter. He's the oldest son of the king, Priam. Um, and we, we, we learn a lot, a lot about him. He's outside the gates of the city of Troy and is ready to fight Achilles. And he should have a real good chance, but the gods are like, no, that's not going to happen. And one of the gods, Athena, tricks him in a way where there's this really poignant moment where Hector is like, wow, I'm fucked. Like he knows, <laughs> he knows exactly what's going to happen, that nothing he could do would change this outcome. So there are moments like that too, where on the one hand, that's kind of terrible, right? No matter what you do, you're doomed. But it's also in a weird kind of way, also kind of reassuring that you've done all you can um, and here's where you are. And so there's, there's, there's not exactly a sense of resignation on Hector's side, but uh, it's a very odd moment. Um, we could read it if you want to. We could. It's a very cool moment. And yeah, it's in, again, it's in book 22. So Hector's outside the gates of the city and Athena comes out. She talks to Achilles privately and then she goes, okay, and here. Uh, Athena caught up with brilliant Hector and likened herself in form and weariless voice to Dephoebus. And that's Hector's brother. So she comes over. She looks like the brother, and she does this. She says, Dear brother, indeed, swift-footed Achilles is using you roughly and chasing you on swift feet around the city of Priam. Come on, then. Let us stand fast against him and beat him back from us. And then Hector and his brother, as he thinks, have this kind of conversation. And then Hector throws his, his spear at Achilles, right? But it doesn't work. The spear bounces right back. The spear was driven far back from the shield, and Hector was angered because his swift weapon had been loosed from his hand in a vain cast. He stood discouraged and had no other spear. So lifting his voice, he called aloud on Dephoebus and asked him for a long spear. But Dephoebus was not near him. Right? He's disappeared. And Hector knew the truth inside his heart and spoke out loud. No use. Here at last the gods have summoned me deathward. I thought Dephoebus the hero was here close beside me, but he's behind the wall, and it was Athena cheating me. And now evil death is close to me and no longer far away, and there is no way out. My death is upon me. Let me at least not die without a struggle, inglorious, but do some big thing first that men to come shall know of it. Mm. Okay, it's a super weird moment. It is, but I also think that moment is underlining i mean all right i should say i've never been a soldier i've never fought in a war neither have you uh, maybe some of our listeners have there's a sense that i have that this is reflecting a certain reality of war yeah that sometimes yeah. in the heat of the battle you will realize that you're in a losing position yeah and it's a sense of what to do then yeah uh, and what you do then is, I mean, they're describing it as do something that will make you glorious, that will make you a Some hero. Big thing. But do something, yeah. Try to make your death count for something, or and 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 you know, you still have to fight. You're still going to get into it. So here's a way of thinking about this doomed mission that might help you get through it and maybe make something better out of it than otherwise it would be. Yeah. No, I think what you're saying is really important. I mean, in two ways. First of all, yeah, you're right. Neither one of us have ever been in that situation. Um, maybe some of our listeners have. One of the things I've been so interested in reading about is the ways in which the Iliad, along with some other works of classical literature, but the Iliad in particular, gets read by veterans, um, especially some who are suffering from PTSD and other kinds of um, challenges that arise from warfare. Um, also read in prisons by people who have also not been in warfare, but been in situations where your life is at stake and your choices are very, very limited. Um, and and it, and the responses are kind of extraordinary. Um, that might be something that some of our listeners might know about. But even though neither you nor I, and probably the majority of our listeners have been in warfare, some of us have been in situations where, or, or been at a loved one who's in a situation where there aren't a lot of choices um, and where you have to do exactly what you said. You're not going to get out of this or you're not going to get out of this the way you hope, what can you do? What is left to you? right? And so that's what I mean by saying it's a very odd moment. Um, he knows, Hector knows in that moment that he's not going to win. There's no way. And because he's not going to win, he's going to die. 
He knows that because he's going to die, he knows what's going to happen to his wife and to his child and to his father and to everybody he loves and the city he loves. He knows all of these things, right? Um, so what is left? I can do some big thing, not to be famous, not to be a hero exactly, right? So, so, so men will hear of it. So something is left. And that is a really interesting – I mean, what's left is what we're doing, right? We're reading it. Right. We're still talking about him so many years later. Yeah. Huh? There are a few other uh, passages that deal with the realities and implications of war in interesting ways. Uh, I think one of the interesting and maybe surprising things to someone who hasn't read the, the text is that the book isn't strictly on one side or the other, that it talks – and comes from the point of view of both the Greeks and the Trojans yeah. and is sympathetic to both of them because it is interested more in the implications and the and, and what the fallout of of war. Mm -hmm. And I know you brought another passage about Hector mm. in full armor interacting with his child. Yeah. Uh, and I thought this might be a good good yeah. passage to turn to now. Yeah, that is I think that is a really good choice. And again, that's a really important point you make that the story is uh not clearly on one side or the other, right? As we mentioned before, right? Uh, the first readers, listeners of this poem, they knew how it was going to turn out. And they're, they're, they're Greeks, right? I mean, the readership of the poem changes a lot over time. And there's stuff we could say about that. But, um, you know, what does it mean to root for the losing side? You know, what does it mean for uh, these early readers and listeners, these Greeks to, like, what do they think about the Trojans? It's clear that this is not just a celebration of Greek military might, this poem. This poem is about a lot of things. But one of the things it's about is the cost of war. What happens to people? in that situation. Um, and that's deeply moving. And as you say, we go back and forth, we see the Greek side, we see the Trojan side. And in some ways, they're equivalent, like there's an equal weight kind of that's given to them, and we learn about them in ways that are parallel. But they're clearly super different. So on the Greek side, we get uh, a sense of the incredibly diverse range of people who are coming. There's this famous section, I think it's in book two, called often called the Catalog of the Ships, which is this some people love it, but I find it an unbelievably boring list of all the different um, groups of uh, people who come from uh, the Peloponnesus, you know, from the Greek domains. Um, so we get a real sense of who's who are the players, who are the major heroes. Achilles is super important, Agamemnon, Odysseus, uh, people who've read the Odyssey. He's a familiar character who shows up here in the uh, in the Iliad. He's very clever, unsurprisingly. So, so we get a sense of the cast of characters on the Greek side, and we also get a sense of the cast of characters on the Trojan side. But importantly, on the Trojan side, it's clearly a family group. You know, we get something like almost a quasi weird kind of family group, um, as we suggested earlier, in Achilles, Patroclus, and Briseis, like they're living in the same tent. It's not really a family group. It's 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 household in some strange kind of sense, right? Um, but on the Trojan side, it's a family. And we're reminded of that in all kinds of ways. Sometimes in really awkward ways that really ring true. Like there's this one moment, right? And it's like at the very end of the poem. It's when Helen, who's been the bone of contention um, uh, between the Greeks and the Trojans um, in all kinds of ways. At the end of the poem, she's um, mourning for Hector after his death. And she's saying how he was always really nice to her in the household in ways that are somewhat reminiscent of what Briseis says about Patroclus, right? He was always really nice to her. And she says, um, even when people in the household would say cruel things to me, not my father-in-law, uh, uh, Priam, he was always kind, but my mother-in-law. And so, you know, bad mothers-in-law clearly go back thousands and thousands of years in literary history. Um, so yeah, there's this real sense of a family dynamic. And Hector, we see him as a warrior. And there are a couple of moments in the poem where we see him as a warrior in a, in a, in a, in a, in a I don't know what to call it, like a, a thrilling and uncanny and disturbing kind of way, uh, a cold, cold-blooded kind of way. But there's also these moments that are very different, like the one you just mentioned. And this one shows up in book six. I'm just going to pull it out. Um, it's a moment when he's come into, con he's in from the battlefield, he's come to sort of confer with the household, including his wife, Andromache. And, um, so there's this scene where they're standing up on the walls of the city looking out on the field. And we talked already about this sort of spectacle of what's going on outside the gates of the city. Um, Hector's wife, Andromache, is holding their little child. His name is Astanax. And she's talking about how much fear she has. Um, she's afraid what will happen if he falls, um, if the city falls. She is worrying about what's going to happen to her and what's going to happen to their child if, if it all goes badly. And he tries to reassure her. 
and then the whole section is really incredible. But the one part that I think is a really, really neat moment comes near the end of this discussion between the two of them. So he's just said, may I be dead and the earth hide me under before I hear you crying and know by this that they drag you away as a captive. Right. So they've had this really painful conversation. So so here's a here's a little bit. So speaking, glorious Hector held out his arms to his baby, who shrank back to his fair-girdled nurse's bosom, screaming and frightened at the aspect of his own father, terrified as he saw the bronze and the crest with its horse hair, nodding dreadfully as he thought from the peak of the helmet. Then his beloved father laughed out, and his honored mother. And at once glorious Hector lifted from his head the helmet and laid it in all its shining upon the ground. Then taking up his dear son, he tossed him about in his arms and kissed him. Again, it's a it's an odd moment. Um, it makes you smile because it's it's sort of sweet and it's playful, and it's also really awful because of what's going on. Andromache has just talked about what will happen if Hector's killed and the city falls. She knows what'll happen. What'll happen to her is even worse than what we've um, seen happen to Perseus. Andromache will for sure be raped. Right? She'll be taken away. She'll be enslaved. And what's going to happen to that child? Right, that child is the son of Hector. So that child is the heir to the throne of Troy. That child's going to be killed. Right, right. We know that. She knows that. He knows that. Right. They've just been talking about this. Right. And and when the child screams and is frightened, um, on the one hand, it's ridiculous and comic. Right. He's a little kid. He's freaked out because there's this bobbing horse tail on the helmet. And he doesn't know what it is that he's looking at. He's just sort of spooked. But it's also awful because we know that child's going to be screaming for real. Hmm. Right, so it's a very strange moment in terms of time. Right, uh, we're in this moment where it's playful and they're laughing. And it's a nice little domestic scene, but we also know that it's a flash forward to another kind of moment that that's coming up. It's almost unbearable, I think, that moment because um, it's it's sweet and charming, and it's also just awful because you know and they know. Yeah, uh, the other another aspect of it that I was picking out when I was looking over this passage that you pulled out for us was that the baby is not recognizing the father who is prepared for war. Yeah. And yeah, so even on yeah. a more fundamental yeah. sense, there's this there's this notion that this war, this involvement in these kinds of uh, activities and institutions and emotions, because this is all still tied back to wrath, mm. that this transforms a man. Mm-hmm, well, this is a very mm-hmm. masculine no, that's, space. But, but that's but right. But it transforms yeah, a man yeah, yeah. in a way that terrifies and alienates him from – the, their family from the home life. He's unrecognizable. He's unrecognizable. The The son is afraid of him. The son and heir is afraid. But assuming that things even went well, the child as the heir would grow up to have to take on that transformation as well himself. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. there's a sort of natural recoiling to it, but a sense that, well, this has to happen. There's this profound sense of change that war enacts on a person mm-hmm, and a body and, mm-hmm. a, and a set of relationships in a community that's seen as both necessary but also terrible. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because, again, it comes back to something we were talking about earlier, the extent to which people make choices and choose their destinies and and and, and deliberately do, you know, deliberately move into the future in certain ways, and the extent to which things happen to you. And, and I think when you talk about men moving into the world of warfare, as we see it in the Iliad, it's very much part of that. Um, uh, on the one hand, you know, if Astanax were to grow up and the Trojans were to be victorious and he were to grow into manhood, right, and not be killed at the fall of the city um, – he, you know, he would grow up. He would get the bronze and the helmet with the horse hair, and he would enter into that, and that's all purposeful and deliberate. But there's also um, moments in the poem where you see men in warfare; they're almost like possessed, and and to an extent, you know, we see that. I mean, above all, I think probably in Achilles, because with that wrath, like he just he's transformed. He's just like this unstoppable thing on the battlefield. Um, but you see in other characters as well, to some extent including this one really neat moment where Hector is going up against the shield wall of the Greeks. Um, so it's it's a sort of a, a, a fortification that they've created for themselves out there on the battlefield, right? They're not fortified within the, the citadel or the city walls in the way the Trojans are, but they've, they've built in a kind of a, a defensive wall for themselves. And Hector busts it open. And and the reason that, that seems important for a couple of reasons. One reason that's important is we see that Hector totally could, like the Trojans could win. If the gods were not intervening in this way, the Trojans could win. Like in terms of their manpower, they could win. 
Um, and Hector is really something else, right? But the other reason, and that's why I mentioned this passage, the other reason it's kind of striking is, is it's a really weird moment because Hector picks up this huge rock as if it says it's like 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 as if a sh- shepherd would have picked up a sheep, right? So it's it's like, yeah, like you have to make a little effort, but it's like not a big deal. And he heaves it at the at their gate. Um and he he looks he looks terrifying. Let me read those, a few of those lines real quick, just a couple of them. It's in book 12, around line 462. Okay, so he's just smashed the gates, right? And the gates bust open. Then glorious Hector burst in with dark face like sudden night, but he shone with the ghastly glitter of bronze that girded his skin and carried two spears in his hands. No one could have stood up against him and stopped him, except the gods, when he burst in the gates and his eyes flashed fire. And it's a real short little passage, but it gives you the sense like glorious Hector burst in. Like this is an unstoppable force, right? And, and it's like he's transformed. So when you were talking about this whole question of the, the little child not recognizing his father, in this moment, Hector is almost not recognizable, right? He's, he, he, he has this face like night. Um, no one could have stopped him. And then there's that neat little parenthetical comment, except the gods, because that's exactly what's going to happen. Right, right. right. Absolutely. That's yeah. the limit of human capacity right there. Exactly. The the other thing that I was thinking about with the with the passage about Hector and his baby is imagining a kind of terrible Hollywood movie mm. in which you have a similar scene where he's going to he's oh, yeah. he's dressed up and he's about to go off to war and you imagine the kid instead of being terrified by this outfit of of war and its implications and its and the fearsomeness of it all, he's instead like he just looks up to his father and he's like, go get him, dad. Kind of, yeah, you know, that yeah. sense of, of, of glory in war. There's a lot of moments uh, where, such as that one, where, where, where men are transformed and become glorious in some way through their actions. But there's always a strong sense that war is, in fact, ha- well, has things other than that glorious moment. Oh, yeah. And I think that's one of the interesting things about the Iliad, is it, especially coming from a position if you don't know anything about the book. No, yeah, you might reputation. think it's all like, yay, war is great. And it's just not. It's, it's not like at war all. is just awful. And it has a much more complicated sense as to what war means and what the implications of war and what going through war is for all involved. Yeah, what happens to the people? Like, what happens to the human beings? I mean, that's what the, I mean, if we were to say what the Iliad is concerned with, it's concerned with a lot of things. But one of the things it's concerned with is what does war do to people? Right, and it might at moments ennoble them, right? It might make them almost like the gods, right? There are the moments like where you're like, "Wow, what was that?" Right, um, and you see it in, in Achilles and Hector, especially, but you see it in some of the other characters as well, where they're like apotheos, right? They're like as if they were gods for a minute, right? But there's also these moments where you're like, "Wow, it's it's just awful. It's just heartbreakingly bad." Um, and you know, I don't know if this is the right moment to recall that, but you know, the few lines that um, we uh, that I read, you know, for us at the very beginning of the program are a beautiful illustration of that. I chose those because they seem to me, I don't know, impossible to forget. I mean, they're lines that I'll, these are lines that I'll involuntarily remember at certain moments, and they touch on exactly what you mentioned: this way that warfare can be kind of this beautiful ennobling, like strength and violence even, can be in some strange kind of way beautiful. I know not everybody finds it, but but there's enough literature and film and art that sees it as beautiful that that we could say there is a beauty, right? But there's also this pathetic awfulness that comes. And, And the power of the Iliad, I think, is to give us both those scenes and that moment at the uh, that I read at the beginning is this moment where Priam, the king of Troy, knows exactly what's going to happen. It's in book 22. He's looking down from the citadel walls of Troy, and he sees his son, his oldest son, Hector, outside there on the field. And he knows what's going to happen. He knows that um, Hector is going to lose. He knows that the city is going to fall, and he knows what's going to happen to him. And he says those wonderful lines. He says, you know, how, you know, for a young man, it's it's all is beautiful while he's in the, you know, in his full physical powers, you know, as he's on the battlefield. And if he's struck down, he's still beautiful, right? The wounded body is still beautiful. But for an old man, um, when he's cut down, where he's retreated in the depths of his own home, and his blood is spilled on the floor, and his dogs, his own dogs um, that used to sit by the fireplace, lap up his blood, that's the most pathetic thing of all. And it's, and, and, 
it's such an odd moment, right? Because again, it's capturing this idea of the beauty of violence and also the patheticness of what happens to somebody in warfare. And again, like some of the other really powerful moments in this poem, it's capturing that weird sense of time where on the one hand, we're in the moment, right? We're in the moment where Priam is talking about what might happen. But we're also in that moment he's imagining when he's dead and he's on the floor and his own dogs are are, are eating him, right? But there's also another moment in the background there, which is when he was like Hector, when he was on the battlefield and he was in his full glory, right? So there's so that's one of the really like, – the book is like such a weird time-traveling kind of thing, right? Because the people, when they're speaking, are often in more than one moment. And we, too, are in more than one moment when we're looking at the Iliad. Like on the one hand, we're looking at this like world from thousands of years ago, but it seems so immediate in some ways, so alien, so much another world in some ways, and so – right now. I, I think it's kind of, it's really remarkable. So we've talked a bit about dipping in and out of this book. You've talked about how that is one of the ways that you teach this book to undergrads. And we've done that in our conversation about this now. One of the other things I remember about the Iliad is that all signs point to it having come out of an oral tradition, that it was probably recited and memorized and adapted in the reciting for a while before it was finally put down on paper, and that it was also performed over the course of three days, and I believe it would take about eight hours each day, over the course of three days in a in a sort of public ritual occasion, that it would be performed publicly. And therefore, because everybody knows the story and everybody has presumably heard this poem last year when they did it at this festival, you could sort of drift in and out. You could come in, you could come to your favorite parts, you could try to catch a bit of it, and then you could leave. That there's a sense that the poem has always been intended to be heard in that way, dipping in and out. Well, yeah, heard and read. You know, like on the one hand, that's absolutely right, that the poem pretty clearly comes out of an oral tradition, and there, there's a lot to say about that. Um, uh, and it can be connected to other kinds of oral poetry traditions, right? But it also gets written down and in fact kind of codified at a certain moment um, uh, in the second century um, in Alexandria, so in, in northern Africa, right? It's what's now Egypt or, or Egypt, right? The, the book gets studied along with um, Homer's Odyssey and the 24 book structure gets imposed upon it. And there's a very rich commentary tradition that uh, grows around the book. And the reason I mention this is I think it's really important to understand it as um, an oral text, but also a written text, like a text that's had many lives, right? So I think sometimes people go, oh, it has this sort of oral um, poetry background, and therefore we must understand it as oral poetry. But I think it's really helpful to understand the extent to which it's inhabited both environments over thousands of years, um, oral and written, and un understanding it in both of those. There's there's a very rich history for both of them. I mean, it functioned as a kind of a school text for generations um, also, right, in this Western tradition. And that's that's part of its history as well um, that we can think about. But what you, the other thing you said that I think is really important is this question of dipping in and out. I mean, it comes back to something we talked about a little bit earlier. Everybody knows where this, what happened before, this whole business with Helen of Troy and so on, right? Everybody knows the, the pre-story and everybody knows the after story, right? Everybody knows what happened before the Iliad. Everybody knows what happened after the Iliad. What we don't know is how and why and how it felt and, and the, 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 the thick, rich emotions of people in the middle. And so people back then felt free yeah. to treat this text as something that you might yeah. dip in and out of. And, and, and that's an important... Yeah, and useful approach to to reading literature in general, I think, uh, and one that often gets sidelined. I know that when teaching freshmen, college freshmen, that they were very anxious about reading the entire book. Oh, when we yeah. had that class, yeah. uh, the Iliad was the first text that we looked at, and one of the students was like, "I no, I have to read the whole thing, otherwise I can't say anything smart about yeah, it." Yeah, like no, I mean it's great to read the whole thing, like that's wonderful, sure, but that absolutely option, not but necessary, right? Um, and that's going to be true of a lot of of um, the books that we're looking at. So, for example, one of the group of um, three books that we're going to talk about in our first few conversations together is Ovid's Metamorphoses, right? And again. You totally can read it beginning to end. It's super long. You can also just pick it up, flip to a random page and read it. And I think this freeing ourselves from the expectation that we must read from like page one to page whatever um, is so great. I remember for me, this real, um, this real breakthrough moment at one point, this must have been like, 
15 years ago or so, um, a very good friend, a very trusted friend had said to me, you've got to read this wonderful book. It was Orhan Pamuk's My Name is Red. Mm. And I was reading it from the beginning and I could not get through it. And I'm like, God, what is wrong with me? I know this is obviously a really good book. I can't read it. I can't read it. So finally what I did was, and I don't even know what made me do it, I read the last chapter. And then I read the second to last chapter. And then I read the third to the last chapter. And after I'd read a few of these, I was like in a headspace where I could then go back to the beginning and read it. it it's kind of trivial and ridiculous, but it was this real breakthrough moment because I, I like everybody else, right, had been so conditioned, you must read beginning to end. And at, after that, I was like, no, you read however you want to read. I had a somewhat similar experience when I was a teenager and tried to read William Burroughs' Naked Lunch, oh. which is written in a very choppy manner anyways. It's not... I, you know, there's no like through line in a real sense, at least not as I remember. But I ended up picking it up, trying to read it cover to cover, getting a bit bored. But I had heard that there were some interesting scenes in it. So I just started flipping through it and I would read sections. It's sort of written, as I remember, it's written in chunks that are about five pages long mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. So I just pick it up at random, read for a bit and put it down. And then it would be an interesting section. And I'd come back next time and pick it up at another point. Eventually I realized I had read the entire book cover to cover, just not in any order. And then I couldn't imagine that reading it in order would have improved the experience. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that really helped free me up from the, the tyranny of uh, linear reading for texts that don't require it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are certain kinds of texts that require it of us and ask it of us. Detective stories are like this, right? Certain kinds of novels are very much like this. We need to be held by the hand, right, as we go through it to, to the journey, the the, the progress of the journey, right? The, uh, the, the unfolding in time of the journey is super important for us. But for other works, not so much. It'll be interesting next time, you know, when we're talking about Plato's Symposium, because I've been thinking about this as we've been talking about reading things out of order. For Ovid, I think this reading out of order thing works great. For the Symposium, I think probably not, because it's really a ladder. You know, it's asking us to do this thing and then do this other thing. Um, it's also way shorter, right? So it's not not at all painful to read um, in a sequential way, but it's doing something very strange. And again, I think like the Iliad, it's doing something that on the one hand is part of the ancient world, but it also feels very fresh. Absolutely. The other side of that is that in addition to thinking about reading in and out, about the fact that people arrive at the Iliad already knowing some of the stories, that part of what the Iliad is is the conversations around the Iliad as well, mm -hmm. that the both the traditions that it's coming out of, the stories that you know about the Trojan War when you approach it, and also the other versions of these events that you've heard. Because I believe, although there may not be many of them currently extant, we have some idea that there were other stories of the Trojan War written by other authors from other perspectives that may have filled in these details differently, sort of like a, a movie reboot these yeah. days, right? Where you've got, oh yeah, but this time they feel differently about it. Or this time so-and-so dies, so-and-so shoots first now. <laughs> that yeah. kind of thing might change. And so the culture around it, the culture around the conversation, the culture around how these stories are told and retold, fold back into the story itself. And you might think about that as just as much a part of reading and, and, and thinking with the text uh, as some sort of pure idealized opening to page one and reading all the way through page 536. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. It really, I mean, just thinking about the story of Troy for a minute, there's a number of other versions. Like, for example, you mentioned earlier the Trojan horse, right? Sometimes students will be reading the Iliad and they're like, where's the Trojan horse? Like, not here, because right? it doesn't show up in that part of the narrative. Um, and if anybody's ever watched any of these, like, there's that awful Troy movie, right? With like Brad Pitt and Eric Bott, incredibly bad, charming in its badness, right? But, but I mean, there, there's one way of thinking about the Iliad is to think of it by itself, right? As, as a work that stands alone. But it's also, you could see it as part of this whole constellation of, things about Troy, stories about Troy. And there's like this sort of whole range of alternative universes, right? Um, and so when we think about um, fiction, different modes of fiction, even fan fiction, we can understand that as being a universe. And there's this universe of Troy, and the Iliad is a really important part of the Troy universe. But it's also part of this other constellation, right, to use a related metaphor, where we think about it being in conversation with other kinds of books. So one place we can think about it as being in conversation with other kinds of books is um, some people might have read at one point Homer's Odyssey, right, which is the story of Odysseus wandering around, right, after the war in Troy is finished. He shows up as a character here in the Iliad, and it's the weirdest thing. He's a minor character. Right. Um, but he's also very clever. And so if you know the Odyssey at all, you find yourself thinking about that. You're like, you, you kind of read what you know from the Odyssey into this minor character. So there's that. And then beyond that, there's this way in which 
the Iliad, uh, like some of the other books we'll talk about, the Ovid's Metamorphoses or Plato's Symposium, end up being part of a conversation that's happening across other kinds of books, you know, where like, I don't know, for example, I mentioned, um, if we think about something like, I don't know, Milton's Paradise Lost, right? Um, it's talking to other books that are written in English, but it's also talking to Dante's Divine Comedy, right? Which is another book we might talk about. They're they're having a conversation with one another. I know that sounds kind of weird to put it that way, but but there's a um, in the same way there's a world of the Troy stories. There's also a, there are also many worlds, like not one world, many different worlds where these books are having conversations with one another. It's really neat to kind of listen in on how they're saying to one another. So while we could probably talk for a couple more hours uh, about just the Iliad, this is about all the time we have for this episode. So any final thoughts for somebody who's become intrigued about the Iliad, uh, maybe who hasn't read it before and wants to give it a bit of a try? First off, which version of the Iliad might they get? And then secondly, is there any way that they can get a good sense of the overview of where to look for the parts that they might be interested in or what the what the overall map of the Iliad is. Yeah. Um, sometimes students, and this would be true for any kind of listener, I think, are, are like, you know, am I going to ruin the plot if I like, you know, if I look up the Wikipedia entry or something like that? And I'm like, no, read whatever you want, right? <laughs> the, the plot, knowing the plot, knowing what happens is not at all going to ruin the Iliad for you, right? Um, so two things. One is that like find whatever, wherever you can. Like I think there is a summary of what happens in every book in on the Wikipedia entry, like anywhere you want just to see what the plot is. That's totally cool. Um, but in terms of translations, like this is a work in ancient Greek, right? How many of us are reading it in ancient Greek? Not too many, right? And so there's a lot of different translations out there. The one I've been reading from is this one by uh, a poet uh, and scholar who was called Richmond Lattimore. And the fact that he was a poet, I think, is super important. He was a, a scholar of Greek. He was at the, if I remember correctly, he was at the University of Chicago. So like he he knew his stuff with regard to you know ancient Greek and, and that world of Homeric epic. But he also had a beautiful gift for language. And that's one of the reasons why I like this translation so much. It's 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 I think beautiful, it's evocative. And he uses language in this strange kind of way where it feels very natural. Um, like you get a sense of the human beings who are saying the words, but there's also these weird moments where he's like coined a phrase or coined a term that sounds weird in English. Um, and so one example of this might be, um, he'll have people speak sometimes and what he says is winged words, you know, words with wings. And the first time I saw this, like, what the hell is that? You know, what does that mean to speak with winged words, you know? Um, and it show, and you start going, well, where does that show up? Sometimes the gods speak with winged words. Sometimes human beings speak that way. The people who speak that way tend to be heroic. Um, sometimes they're speaking in a very lofty, powerful way. Sometimes they're being very intimate and emotional. And so you have to ask yourself, what does that mean, you know, for a word to have wings? So that's what I mean by the translation being on the one hand, very familiar, very immediate. There's a lot of one-syllable words, right? It feels very immediate. But it also feels weirdly foreign at certain moments. So it's our English and also not our English. Um, and only a poet is going to do that. Excellent. All right. Well, remind us again, what are we going to get to read next episode? Next time, we're going to be talking together about Plato's Symposium. And this is also um, a, a work from you know the ancient world, right? And while not a lot of our listeners might have heard of the symposium in particular, almost everybody has heard of Plato. Plato is a famous philosopher. He was the teacher of an even more famous philosopher, Aristotle. And the symposium is this really fascinating book. We might wonder, you know, if it's a work of philosophy, why are we talking about this in, um, you know, a conversation that's about literature, right? But it's philosophical, but it's also a very, very beautiful piece of writing. And it's about love. And I know that sounds kitschy and kind of stupid, but it's about love in a very strange way. The the symposium is I was going to say a dinner party, but it's not primarily a dinner party. It's primarily a drinking party um, where there might be snacks. Right? <laughs> and so a whole bunch of people are gathered together and they're having this drinking party. It's a sort of a celebration. Socrates is there, who's the um, teacher of Plato and they're therefore the teacher grandfather, as it were, of the philosopher Aristotle. And they get together and they have a conversation about love. And each one of the guests talks about how you might define love and kind of tells a story to explain it. And it sounds like precious and cutesy, but it's not. It's actually super dark um, and beautiful in unexpected and strange ways. And then there's this weird thing that happens, a big surprise when uh, a, 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 an extra dinner guest busts in at the end. And that reflects in a really interesting way on the conversations that have come before. Um, if anybody wants to take a look at it before next time, um, I like the translation by Robin Waterfield, 
but there's probably other translations out there too. Um, but it's 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 a it's a really weird and fascinating text. It is it is a complete treat. It's also uh, it is a philosophy text that has a plot. Oh yeah. Uh, but it's very short, very readable. It is, I think, my second favorite Plato dialogue. Uh, but more on that next time. Meanwhile, if any listeners want to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. Show notes with links for books that we've mentioned will be available at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash one. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time, we'll see you at The Spouter Inn. Lovely. Lovely.